Thank you, Valentina, and uh, thank you to my fellow panelists and uh, to the participants. It's a pleasure to share what we have learned in the last six years in regard to the Ebola vaccine deployment. Uh, I would just begin by making a statement that it is possible to build and maintain trust in vaccination programs for as long as communities are equal stakeholders in the rollout of the vaccine and not simply uh, recipients of the vaccine. I think that was the main uh, principle or guide for the EBODA project uh, where we supported countries to, to deploy the Ebola vaccine. Next slide, please. So those were the partners in the Ebola vaccine deployment acceptance and compliance program. It was London School, Janssen, uh, World Vision and Grameen Foundation. We got funding from the Innovative Medicines Initiative and from the European uh, Pharmaceutical uh, Association. Next, please. Um, those are the four countries where the Ebola vaccine was deployed. In Sierra Leone, we simply had a clinical trial. Uh, we had less than 1,200 participants. In Uganda, we also had a study which was about 800 participants, health workers. In Rwanda, we had a campaign which was a general population campaign. About 110,000 people have been vaccinated uh, with the Ebola vaccine within a space of less than six months uh, when the program started. And in DLC, about 22,000 people were vaccinated uh, within a space of three months. Next slide, please. So what were the di dilemmas uh, at the beginning of 2014, uh, 2015, when this project uh, was launched? As you all know, uh, the Ebola vaccine was deployed during the outbreak um, of Ebola, uh, just like the COVID vaccine is being um, rolled out during the pandemic. So one of the key questions that we had at that time is, how do you ensure community participation, full community participation and engagement during an outbreak? This is a dilemma that the COVID vaccine is also going to face. How do you ensure that the right person uh, who received dose one yeah, is the same person that received dose two at the right time because many of the vaccines, as you've heard from the other presenters, panelists, are two dose vaccines. This will be a dilemma to handle uh, when these vaccine rollouts happens. The other one is safety and efficacy of the vaccine, uh, which, which points uh, mainly to issues of trust. Um, communities asking, is this vaccine safe? Does it work? This was also a key dilemma. Um, in other words, uh, one, of the, one of the community members asked us, uh, how can you uh, drive a car while you're making it? In other words, why do you roll out a vaccine that is under development? It was a really tough question, but of course we had uh, responses to that. The other key dilemma that we faced is how do you build the capacity of frontline health workers during the epidemic while following the SOPs for disease and infection prevention. And of course, how do you ensure that countries um, prepare uh, the demand side aspects of vaccine deployment in a more comprehensive manner? There is always a, there's always a practice of focusing on the supply side and forgetting the community or the demand side. Next slide, please. So this project, EBODAC, the Ebola Vaccine Deployment Acceptance and Compliance Project, was basically designed to answer those dilemmas and to come up with solutions that could support um, effective rollout of the vaccine while addressing the dilemmas, especially those on the demand side, which, are, which deal directly with community engagement and participation. Next slide, please. And the next one. So in Sierra Leone, like I said, we only had 1,075 participants who volunteered to take part in the clinical study, in the clinical trial studies. Uh, there were infants, 40, 11 months, um, one to three years, uh, pediatrics, 40, 11 years. We had adults in 12 to 17 years, then adults above 18. 
as you can see, the sample there is small because we were just doing the first uh, clinical trial um, within general populations in Sierra Leone. Next. In DLC, we were able to vaccinate about 22,000 people within a space of three months. So it is actually possible that if you involve the community and build trust, you can have people come up to take the vaccine. Within three months, 22,000 people volunteered or accepted to take the vaccine within a small town. I wouldn't want to call it a small town, within a town of Goma, which is on bordering of uh, uh, Rwanda. Next slide, please. In Rwanda, again, in two districts bordering DRC, Rubavu and Rizizi, 110,000 people were able to take uh, the Ebola vaccine within a period of six months. That's a big achievement, uh, given that this was a new vaccine. Uh, there was a lot of stigma. There was a lot of misinformation. There were lots of uh, rumors around it. And there was no outbreak of Ebola in Rwanda. The fact that uh, uh, the program managed to engage the communities and the stakeholders and motivate Sage. We encourage and have 110,000 people accept to take the vaccine within a period of six months shows a great success. As you can see, the blue one is dose one. The blue line shows dose one and the green line shows dose two. So one of the challenges and the key lesson learned here during the Ebola vaccine deployment is as you work so hard to create demand and acceptance for dose one, it's very critical to think about how you're going to ensure there is compliance for those two. Acceptance of those one does not simply uh, translate into acceptance to come back and take those two. There are many people in the communities having taken those one, they already feel comfortable that this is enough. They come, they make their own conclusions and judgments and will not appear for those two. So as we roll out the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, it is very important that we have very specific guidance on how countries will ensure they mobilize and work with communities to ensure compliance for those two. Otherwise, you will miss out on the issues of effectiveness of the vaccine. Next slide, please. So there are some reasons uh, why, despite the, the achievements that I've just shared, how communities accepted to take the vaccine within a a short period of time, three months in DRC, 22,000 vaccinated within the city of Goma. Uh, within six months in Rwanda, 110,000 people vaccinated within two borderline districts. And then uh, 1,075 people accepting to take the Ebola vaccine during the outbreak, uh, to be participants during the outbreak of Ebola in Sierra Leone. There, there are very common reasons why people refuse to take the vaccine. Uh, Heidi has already um, shared some of these reasons. Uh, Lisa has also shared, Margaret has also spoken to some of these, and Thomas. So they are not things that we don't know. They are, they are not different from what we have known before. There is a belief, for instance, in, in all the countries we have worked in that the Ebola vaccine or vaccination will result in two death. Definitely people are saying the same thing today. So how do we design the right communication to counter this. The issue around side effects um, or the vaccine itself causing the disease. I don't have the disease. The moment I get the vaccine, I will get the disease. Many people believe in this and think this, this can happen. How do we deal with that? The, the belief that these vaccines are meant to exterminate certain populations in the world. How do we deal with that? This has happened during the Ebola vaccine. It's being talked about today during a COVID vaccine. The belief uh, that there are two different kinds of vaccine, one given to the community is not effective. This is a really going to be a big challenge. From a field level, as a person who's best in the field, one of the biggest challenges we faced in DLC was the presence of two Ebola vaccines. And there was a rumor that the vaccine in DLC uh, was the community said it was class B, in other words, it was a less quality than the vaccine that was being given in Rwanda. So you are going to have situations where communities class five vaccines based on the countries that are using them. For instance, 
if you have a vaccine manufactured by a certain company being used in South Africa, and then you have another vaccine being used in DRC, because South Africa is a much more developed country and economically more uh, positioned than DRC or Uganda, communities could think that the vaccines in the much developed countries are much better than the vaccines in the lower developed countries. How do we deal with the issue of introduction yeah. of several vaccines yeah. within the same geographical areas during the same time? How do we manage that and communicate effectively about it? There are concerns about side effects. My, my colleagues, the panelists have talked about it. I think it is very critical uh, that the issue of side effects is not addressed when side effects happen. The issue of side effects must be talked about even before we roll out the vaccines. Let the communities know. My experience with communities that if you give them the factuals, the facts and the accurate information, they are willing to take the facts over misinformation and they are always willing to make the right decision. So it's not good for us to keep quiet about side effects and only address it when they come up. There are some concerns about immediate side effects, of course, not prevalent as in the long term. Of course, there is also the issue that these vaccines are under experimental status and therefore some communities doubt them. So these, these are common um, beliefs, common uh, uh, assumptions that people have about vaccines that we have seen in the border vaccine that are already presenting themselves in the COVID vaccine rollout process. Next slide, please. So what lessons have we learned in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, issues of mistrust and trying to build uh, a communities uh, trust in the vaccine program? so that you have greater acceptance and the uptake of the vaccine. It is very important that we address the concerns around vaccination and mistrust. And these are some of the things that we have done. We have made sure that we explain the importance, and for this case, it was the Ebola vaccine, and why it might help to achieve greater coverage. It's been very critical that that is done. People want to know the benefits. Even when you're buying a form, one of the questions that we all will ask is what makes this phone better than the other? What is it that will do for me that my existing phone is not doing? Communities want to hear about the benefits, not necessarily about the details of the science, but what is the benefit of this vaccine? We need to speak openly about vaccine side effects and let communities ask questions. There is nothing wrong with discussing side effects. And because the COVID-19 vaccine has become um, a public uh, development uh, process, everybody now in the world knows what's going on, especially on social media, YouTube, wherever you go to, even on local radios in Africa, there's an update. Uh, what Thomas was giving as an update uh, about the development of vaccine. There are many radio, local radios in Africa which are translating these updates into local languages and running special programs telling communities what's happening in the vaccine. So when a side effect happens, uh, like uh, in the US, communities in Africa will know about it because somebody is talking about the side. So let's be open and talk about side effects and let communities know what the side effects will be when it vaccines and let them ask questions. Let's talk about the other routine vac vaccines that already are known. So it, let's, let's not operate in the COVID-19 space as if yeah. this is the only vaccine that has ever happened. There are other vaccines which people are taking, polio, mm -hmm. corona, TB, ETC. There are vaccines that exist. Why are we, uh, why I would advise that, I would advise based on our Ebola vaccine experience that we need to talk about other vaccines alongside the COVID-19 vaccine. So people know that this is not the first vaccine. There are other vaccines that have been given, they've been successful, they could have had side effects, but they were good vaccines. Let's make sure our healthcare workers understand how the vaccine functions and trust it. One of the areas of, co of resistance or hesitance is, comes from the people who administer the vaccine, even doctors, are asking questions. So what do you expect a, a common rural boy or man 
in a remote village in Mangi in DRC or in Kasese in Uganda to do or when they come across information around COVID, they are definitely going to ask a question. So if you want to improve acceptance and build trust, we need to make sure that our frontline health workers are people who understand and have been trained to explain how this vaccine functions so that they can build trust. If the health workers are not able to build, to explain, then there will be mistrust around this vaccine. We have done this during the Ebola vaccine where we even we ensure that the, 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 the health workers that are administering the vaccine are well trained, but also the community health workers that are mobilizing uh, the communities are trained and given information updates as things evolve so they can communicate new messages based on what we are learning. It's very important that we work with community leaders and influencers. Next slide, please. Then the other key lessons we are learning from the Ebola is think about remote training. As we roll out the COVID-19 vaccine, there will be need for update training or refresher training for health workers, for community health workers. How do we ensure this training goes on without being a source for the spread of the disease or the infection? So can we think about how we can do remote training during this time as we roll out the vaccine, because capacity building would be one of the greater needs that is required for successful rollout of the vaccine. How much are we listening vis-a-vis -vis messaging? Are we spending most of our time communicating and sending out messages, or are we listening to the communities to understand what they're experiencing? So it is very critical, and we have done this under the Ebola vaccine deployment to listen. We have intentionally worked with the community to select listeners. The listeners are not the same as the messengers, those who communicate the message. We found it appropriate to have listeners and the communicators because we noticed that communicators usually would not listen when communicating effectively. So those who listen have always been different from those who communicate and we are able to pick this information and then bring the listeners and the communicators the together so they can work together to ensure uh, effective engagement of the communities. I've already talked about participants' compliance and retention. What plans do we have to ensure that participants take those two besides taking those one? Otherwise, we risk having, even when we do a lot of community engagement and mobilization, many community members coming up to take those one of the vaccine, but not coming back to take those two of the vaccine, which will undermine the objective of the vaccination. What plans do we have in terms of virtual community versus physical community? Every time we talk about community engagement, we are thinking about the geographical community. The world has changed. Uh, people in Europe are directly communicating with people in Africa and Asia. They have created virtual communities and they are influencing each other. How do we ensure that that happens? Now, when we come to technology, technology is key in the rollout of vaccine. We did use technology in the rollout of the Ebola vaccine. One of the most critical things here is going to be identification of who has taken a vaccine because you're talking about 20% of, uh, uh, let me say, you're, you're talking about uh, billions and billions of doses and millions of people to be vaccinated. In my rural area village where I come from, how are we going to manage ensuring that Robert who took dose one is Robert who took dose two? Because it is common, especially in my context within some of the African countries where I've worked, where people uh, replace their siblings or their relatives for the second dose. This is common. So if the vaccines are not enough, Robert has taken those one. Robert could possibly refer his brother with the same identification uh, documents that were given to him to come and take those two. We did, we did manage to eliminate this in the Ebola vaccine deployment by using biometric kits to identify unique vaccine takers or people who are vaccinated. We are also able to use technology to ensure that people come back for those two. In other words, the moment you take those one, the system automatically generates your return date schedule. 
So it will then communicate with you remotely five days before your return date scheduled for those two, three days before your return date scheduled for those two, two days before your return date scheduled, and on the day of the vaccine day. If you miss your vaccination schedule date, the system will then now start to communicate with you about the options available for you to go for vaccination. It creates now a follow-up window. You still have this window. You have missed your vaccination. Please go back for those. How do we ensure that is integrated into the rollouts that we are doing so that we have compliance for those one and two? The issue of side effects in the Ebola vaccine deployment, we have created what we call green lines. And the green lines here, I'm not talking about lines within the health facilities where vaccinations are happening. This is a space where community members call in to talk about their concerns about the, role, the vaccine rollout, but also to communicate about the NSAV adverse effects that could be identified at community level or any effects that uh, communities are reporting as a result of the vaccine. Are we able to create that platform where people can call in the way you call into a, a helpline in a bank or in a telecom company to get help? It has been very helpful for us in DLC when we use the green line to try and manage all the issues and understand what the community is saying at a time, but also to be able to respond to any severe. One of the things that limits acceptance and trust in vaccinations is when I arrive at the vaccination site and the vaccination site is extremely busy. In other words, I arrive at 10 a.m. and I'm going to leave the vaccine. How many people will be willing to wait? In other words, how can we inter use technology to schedule vaccination uh, programs at community level? where people know when they are expected to come so that we don't have people simply flooding the sites to come and get vaccinated. That might also create hesitancy and acceptance of the vaccine. Next slide, please. There's a few cross-cutting things that I would like to talk about that we have learned during the deployment of the Ebola vaccine. One. We need to invest in understanding what are the specific safeguarding issues uh, in the communities where we are working. You could call them child protection issues specifically. And I've given this example. Um, we are talking about the elderly as part of the priority populations to receive the vaccine. But anybody who has worked in Africa, who has lived in Africa, who are all caretakers or caregivers of children of their children. In my own mother's house, she has three children. They are not her children, they are her grandchildren. Her children have given birth to these children and have taken them to her to look after them as they go to work away from the country. So how is my elderly mom, who is eight years, if she's selected as one of those to take the vaccine, going to accept to take the vaccine and leave the other three little children behind? She considers those three children the most important in terms of priority to receive the vaccine. So we need to understand the issues around safeguarding and how they are going to influence uh, decision makings within the populations where we work in certain communities. So they do not become um, obstacles to acceptance to take the vaccine. The other important one is to create issues around social accountability in, social, in communication and community engagement. In the Ebola vaccine projects, uh, we worked with the governments to set up what we called community advisory boards. So these were social accountability platforms, which basically were more informed about what the supply side, side is supposed to do. The, you know, words, the government, uh, the health facilities, the health workers, and what the communities were supposed to do. What were the roles and responsibilities? What were my responsibility as a person to take and what were the responsibilities of the vaccinators? or the people providing the vaccine. What have we signed up to do so that we hold each other accountable? So these platforms, the community advisory boards, were very crucial in informing uh, the government or our site vaccination sites what the issues the community is raising in terms of not, uh, not, uh, not aligning to the agreements that we have agreed upon with the community. We have also found that it is very critical to do gender uh, to, to address gender barriers to access. In many of our vaccination programs, especially in DLS, we found that uh, engaging young men and adult men deliberately helped us uh, 
penet overcome issues of um, of hesitance yeah. or trust in in taking the vaccine one because uh, these are the working groups within many of the communities who are doing the work they are also extremely busy uh, they also have a lot of access to information social media they are also mobile and they have a lot of influence on the communities where they are coming from or their households can we deliberately ensure that we do a gender analysis to understand what could be the drivers uh, to vaccine hesitancy that are driven by social constructions within the communities where we work and address those issues as part of the plans to engage community. We have also learned a big lesson. Uh, you hardly find any country that has no neighboring country. Uh, apart from one that I could name, uh, maybe Greenland. Uh, but all these, or Iceland, uh, all these other countries, we have neighbors. In Africa, it will be very important, uh, based on what I've seen, to manage the cross-border coordination. Because then you are likely to have people moving from one country to go to another country to get vaccinated and go back to their country which is going to undermine the projections, the planning that countries are doing. But also, it is something that is going to undermine trust because if the citizens of that country know that uh, vaccinations are being taken by another country, then the, there is likely to be some trust issues or some conflict issues between the neighboring communities, which will affect our ability to provide uh, good vaccination programs. So how much can we ensure that cross-border coordination does not undermine vaccine acceptance? It also helps us pick rumors across the borders so that they can be addressed. Next slide, please. So the, the demand working group on which Lisa sits with her colleagues uh, that she has also mentioned, I also sit on that group has come up with key principles in planning for vaccine acceptance and uptake and i'm happy to share them she has already shared some of them but these are very specific to communication and community engagement in terms of building trust one is ensuring high level political support that would be very essential second is using of behavior and social data for planning monitoring and evaluation of uh, any community programs for demand creation that will we need to ensure there is social listening and rumor tracking. We need to ensure that we communicate in a very clear and timely manner, because if you leave every time you leave space in communication, a gap, somebody is going to fill it up with either misinformation or half truths. Engage communities in for engage communities for involvement in planning, gathering, and enhancing feedback. It shouldn't be a top-bottom process, but it should be a process that is driven equally by all stakeholders, build the capacity so that people know what to communicate, what to do, so that we do not give room for misinter misinterpretation or mis miscommunication. Next slide, please. Ebodak has developed a number of tools, uh, which we are uh, happy to share uh, with uh, the foundation. We have a comprehensive digital, comp uh, comprehensive demand side analysis tool we have also developed a practical guide for vaccine deployment. We have developed a handbook on lessons learned. We have done a rapid assessment tool for fragile contracts, which has been used in DLC. We have just released an evaluation report on, on uh, Ebola vaccine, community engagement and acceptance, and many others which I'll be able to share. Uh, I want to conclude by this statement. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was a statement by Peter Piot in uh, February 2017. You can see this is two years before COVID-19. He said, no vaccine trial study campaign or rollout without community engagement from day one. That is the advice he gave. And I hope that uh, this he gave during the Ebodax Symposium. And I'm hoping that this would be one of the guides in the way we roll out uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. 